Um, I have known Tiffany for 10 years. I figured that out this morning. Um, it's hard to imagine that it's been that long and how quickly it's gone by. Um, Tiffany uh, is from Wisconsin. She uh, went to University of Wisconsin undergrad and uh, got a degree in nursing. And then she actually went into the workforce for about three years and then realized that she wanted to become a doctor. So she went back to the University of Wisconsin and went to medical school and did great, uh, not surprisingly, as for those of you that know her. Um, and then uh, finished medical school and thought she was gonna be an emergency room physician. And then she saw the light after uh, about six months and realized she didn't want to be a, an emergency room physician, even though she was the she won the award for the best emergency room consultant uh, the year that she was an emergency room intern. Uh, but she saw the light, went back into the match, uh, and then matched at the University of Wisconsin in surgery. And in 2012, um, I had moved to Wisconsin as the surgeon in chief of the Children's Hospital there, and, and Tiffany began her internship year in 2013. And uh, we have known each other since. She approached me in 2013 and said, I think I want to be a pediatric surgeon. And I said, I think we probably should see how your surgical training goes for a year or so. And then I think in 2014, I said, I think you should be a pediatric surgeon. And so uh, it's been, it's been a, a pleasure to know her and see her uh, progress through her career and, and ultimately um, come to pediatric surgery. She spent two years, uh, for those of you that know about pediatric surgery, generally everybody uh, that goes into pediatric surgery spends a certain amount of time in the lab doing research and building your, your CV for your application to, to apply for pediatric surgery. So uh, after much consternation about which lab would be the best for her, um, we decided that transplant lab would be uh, the best for her because she had an interest in transplant. She spent two years in a transplant lab and she did great there. <clears throat> um, and there's there's a little bit of irony in the fact that she did the transplant research, understanding that she wanted to do pediatric surgery. Um, ultimately, she matched here with us, which I, I'm very happy that that happened. Uh, but she is going to go off and do a transplant fellowship next year. So she will be one of probably 10 people in the country who are board certified in pediatric surgery and transplant surgery. So um, her, her, her academic career is really been quite amazing. She's got 36 publications of which over half of those are first author publications, 10 book chapters, numerous presentations. Um, so I expect that um, she will continue to put her fingerprints all over uh, pediatric surgery when she finishes as well. One quick story, she's talking about uh, lung disease today to give you guys a sense of uh, how much of a go-getter and a doer she is. Um, I, I was asked to write a book chapter about empyema and uh, lung infections. And the resident that I had asked to help me <clears throat> had, uh, had not stepped up in the task. And so uh, before Tiffany started here, she and I were talking and I, I was working on the book chapter and I was like, hey, if you want to write this book chapter, you can do that, that's no problem, but I need it in, I need it in 10 days. I got it in three <laughs> days. Three days she had the book chapter turned around to me to, to be able to send to it. To the publisher. So that's the type of person she is. We've all seen her be like that for the two years or a year and a half that she's been here. So Tiffany, thank you for everything you do and for what you do for our patients in the hospital. And uh, we look forward to your, your talk this morning. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, so like Dr. Asa said, I'm going to be talking about complex lung pathology today. I have no disclosures. Um, so the objectives are outlined for the talk is going to be, first, we're going to discuss chest tube management and troubleshooting of chest tubes. Um, then we'll discuss empyemas, necrotizing pneumonias, bronchopleural fistulas, and pulmonary abscesses. So just to start out, it's important to have a good understanding of chest tube management and troubleshooting. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a normal chest tube atrium. Um, it has multiple different components. So this is your collection chamber. This is where you'll be able to record how much and what quality of output you're having each day. This is your chest tube drain connector. Um, if for some reason you have to change out your atrium, there's a little valve here that you can release and change out the atrium. There's also a port up here that you can take sterile specimens from without um, violating the system. This is your suction regulator and your suction bellows that lets you know how much suction you're on. And this is where you place your suction tubing in order to make the suction work. And then finally, this is your air leak monitor. 
So for those of you who haven't set up an atrium, it's actually very simple. There's this pre-filled syringe on the back that you just take out. You place the water into the suction container and it fills up your water seal. You wanna get it up to two centimeters and it turns blue. And once that's done, you can just connect it to the patient. There's some adapters in the OR um, that we can use for the smaller chest tubes. And then you just connect your suction to the top in order to make the suction work. It's important to keep your suction at least negative 80 millimeters um, in order to have your bellows completely come out. You should be watching for the bellows to come out um, past the line that is this little arrow here. Um, if you ever get an order or you're placing an order to adjust the suction, this is how you do it. Um, this is your suction regulator. It can go between 10 and negative 40. Um, it goes by intervals of five. And there's a small little um, uh, dial on the side of the suction, which is what you dial up and down in order to change that. So a lot of people ask me, how do I know whether or not to put a chest tube to suction or water seal? A very simple way to look at it is if you have a, um, a chest tube on suction, you're looking for an air leak or a pneumothorax. The reason for that is the job of the suction is to evacuate the pneumothorax or to allow the lung to stay up um, so it doesn't collapse if you have an ongoing air leak. If you're putting a chest tube to water seal, you usually don't have an air leak or a pneumothorax because the water seal allows the patient to passively drain their chest tube and it allows the patient to be more mobile because they're not hooked up to suction. Um, it's very difficult as a former nurse to get a portable suction device in order to walk your patient with a suction attached. Um, I will say that some providers do believe that chest tubes should be to suction if you have high output or viscous output, um, but that has been studied. Um, this study was done in patients who had chest tubes after pulmonary surgery. I will, there is a caveat to this talk that a lot of the literature is written on post-operative chest tubes, not necessarily chest tubes for infection or necrotizing pneumonias. But when they looked at 10 randomized controlled trials in over 1,600 patients, they found that suction did not change your ability to adequately drain the chest. All it did was increase the duration of time you had a chest tube in and it increased the duration by about a day. This makes sense if you clinically know a lot about chest tubes because usually you want your chest tube to water seal for about 24 hours before you take it out um, just to make sure your lung isn't gonna drop. So if you keep your chest tube to suction until you're ready to take it out, you're probably gonna add a day on your chest tube. So I get a fair amount of questions from residents about clamping. Um, and I will tell you, I trained in a place where we clamp chest tubes not infrequently. So to me, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. That being said, um, I do have a lot of attendings that I know and respect who don't believe that you should clamp a chest tube under really any circumstances. It is controversial. The reason it's controversial is you do put the patient at risk for attention pneumo because they can't drain. Um, I was taught that clamping a chest tube was like taking out a chest tube without taking it out. Um, and so there's basically three circumstances that you would clamp a chest tube. First, if you think you have like some type of a subclinical air leak and you're worried when you take out your chest tube, your lung is going to drop. Second, if you're worried about your patient's ability to reabsorb the fluid. Um, and then finally, if you're administering medications for the chest tube. Um, the important things to remember if you are going to clamp a chest tube is that you want to make sure to monitor your patient. I usually keep them on continuous pulse ox and telly. And then you need to have like very clear goals about what you're doing with your clamping trial. So what I usually tell the residents is if you're clamping for a subclinical air leak, we're going to clamp the chest tube for four hours. We're going to get a chest x-ray. If the lung is up, we're going to pull the chest tube. If you're clamping because you want to make sure the patient can reabsorb the fluid, you say, I'm going to clamp the chest tube for 24 hours. I'm going to get a chest x-ray. If there's a residual effusion, we'll keep the chest tube. If there's not, we're going to pull the chest tube. And then obviously, if you're administering medication, there's pretty standard times for when you want to clamp the chest tube. Um, so if you're taking care of a patient who has a chest tube on your service, whether you're a medicine doctor or surgery doctor, I think it's important to have a basic algorithm for your chest tube daily assessment. So this is mine. I start with looking at the chest x-ray in the morning. I want to look to see, is there an effusion? Is the lung well expanded? Is my chest tube in the chest? Um, and then once I look at the chest tube, I go to the um, bedside and I look at the setting. So I want to make sure, is it to water seal or suction as appropriately ordered? If it is to suction, is the bellows out? So is the suction appropriate? Then I check the tubing to look what quality is in the tubing. Is it purulent? Is it serosanguinous? Is it serous? And then how much did it put out over the last 24 hours? I usually check for kinks in the tubing, knowing that the most common site for a kink is actually at the insertion site. So it's usually hidden underneath the dressing, which is nice. And then the last thing that I check for is something called titling. So titling tells you whether or not the chest tube is patent. Um, so if you ask the patient to breathe, you'll notice that this ball and this column of water will go up and down. Um, that shows you that the chest tube adjusts to the increasing and decreasing intrathoracic pressure. So if you have good titling on your chest tube, you know your chest tube is patent. 
Um, if you don't have titling, um, there's a couple of reasons. Number one is sometimes infants just don't have good titling. And the reason is that their respiratory um, effort and their title lines are so small, sometimes they don't move the, um, the column very well. Um, but if you have an older child who doesn't have titling, you have to kind of look to see why your chest tube is not peeing. So you want to take down your dressings. You can try flushing the chest tube both towards the atrium and towards the patient sterilely. And then you can try to strip the tubing. If you can't figure it out, then often you'll have to replace the chest tube. So the next thing I look for is an air leak. So there's a couple of different types of air leaks. So you can have an iatrogenic air leak, and that's basically when you have a break in your system. So the most common place to see a break in your system is at one of the connection points. So if there's a break, you'll see a little air leak. There's also non-provoked air leak. What that means is if the patient is just sitting in bed and they, they're breathing normally and you notice that there's bubbling in the chamber, and then you can see a provoked air leak. Provoked air leaks happen when you have increased intrathoracic pressure and that causes leakage from the lung. So the two ways I use to provoke an air leak is I'll ask the patient to cough. If they're on a ventilator, I'll deep suction them and stimulate a cough. Um, and then if the kids are having too much pain for that, I'll have them put their thumb in their mouth, close tightly around their thumb and then blow like they're blowing on a trumpet. And that will also increase the threshold and you'll see an air leak. Once you see an air leak, you wanna assess for the severity of the air leak. So this is a continuous air leak. That usually means that there's significant damage to the lung. An intermittent air leak, we see more often with like small staple line leaks. And then this is a no air leak and you still see like the titling of the water level. Um, so the next question that I ask myself is, can I take the chest tube out? Um, and if you ask, how, can, how do I know when it's ready to take the chest tube out, it kind of depends on who you ask. So first, you want to make sure you don't have a continuous air leak or some other reason to keep it in. But if it's just a numbers game, um, small kids, you can usually take out a chest tube somewhere between one to two milliliters per kilogram per day. A larger kid that's like more adult size, we usually use 100 to 150. In the adult world, we push the envelope quite often and use between 100 and 250. And actually, there's new studies in the adult world that are actually pushing the threshold to up to 300. Again, it's important that the caveat for this is that these are um, chest tubes that are being placed for post-operative um, effusions, not infectious effusions. I wouldn't recommend kind of any of these higher thresholds for someone who has an ammonia or an empyema um, or for kind of a small child. So now that we know a little bit about chest tube management, we're going to start using that practically and talking about empyemas. So the pathophysiology of an empyema is that you get pleural inflammation that causes increased vascular permeability. Then you get an influx of inflammatory cells and fluids into your chest. That fluid becomes infected and purulent. It's important to remember that there are two types of empyemas. There's a primary empyema, which most of us are most comfortable with, where you have translocation of the bacteria from a lung infection into the fluid. And then there's secondary empyemas where they're secondary to trauma or esophageal injuries, a neoplasm, bacteremia, or some type of a diaphragmatic infection. No matter what the cause of your empyema, um, the treatment's pretty much the same. So between 0.6 and 2% of all pediatric pneumonias will result in an empyema. Of those children, about 2 to 8% of them will require um, hospitalizations um, for their or, Two to eight percent of them will be two. Two to eight percent of all the hospitalized kids will have empyemas, and then thirty-five to fifty-eight percent of those hospitalized kids will require ICU level care for their empyemas. So the first step is to get radiographs. So your initial radiograph um, shows you uh, blunting with the costophrenic angle, and then some layering of fluid in the chest. Um, it's important to do lateral and DQ views. They tell you whether or not the fluid that you're looking at is free flowing or loculated. Um, and then if you have severe cases of empyema or fluid, you'll see this mediastinal shift with as shown in this x-ray here. And that's just the fluid pushing um, the mediastinum to the contralateral side. Um, the interesting thing about chest x-rays is it's often difficult to determine whether you have parenchymal disease or pleural disease. So even after you drain your empyema, you'll often see a significant amount of pacification. And then for this patient, I just put a star here because he's got a lucency in the center of his chest, which is likely either a pneumatocele or a loculated pneumothorax. Um, to get more information, you go next go to an ultrasound. This is a dynamic imaging modality. It doesn't require any radiation exposure. It also gives you information about whether the fluid is free flowing or loculated. And it can give you evidence about whether or not you have a trapped lung. Um, so you can actually see the lung moving in real time. Um, it also helps to distinguish between your pleural space, which is an avascular plane, and your parenchymal space, which is vascular. And it's actually really sensitive for small infusions. So this is an example of a 
ultrasound done for an empyema, you can see the um, arrows show like the thickening line to the pleura from the inflammation. The star area is the fluid collection. You can see these septations um, that are pretty characteristic of an empyema. And then I um, label the lung tissue for you. Um, you can see how that lights up. Um, the other imaging modality we use for empyemas is chest CT. It's important if you're ever going to order a CT of the chest for an infectious etiology, you want to get it with IV contrast. And the reason for that is it gives you pleural enhancement. It also helps you differentiate between the parenchymal disease and the pleural disease. Um, so this is an example of a chest CT. Um, so the first thing you're going to look at is the lung tissue itself. So you'll see that the lung tissue is, um, is opacified and it's not enhancing, and that's pretty characteristic of a necrotizing infection. And then you look at the pleural disease. So this is um, the empyema. And so usually pleural disease is this pretty homogeneous gray color. And you can see that it usually scallops around the lung. That's pretty characteristic. Um, and then sometimes you'll see these little air pockets within your empyemas. And those are examples of either a loculated pneumothorax or a bronchopleural fistula. So because we're always trying to limit the amount of radiation we use in kids, there's been several studies that have looked at um, ultrasound versus CT for evaluating empyemas in children. Um, and they basically show the same thing, that these are relatively equivalent tests. Um, the study by Gaffey et al. did show that you do get a little bit better parenchymal um, imaging with the CT scan, but ultimately that additional information didn't alter the treatment regimen or predict patient outcomes for these kids. And so ultimately, the conclusion of both the authors were that you should be reserving the chest CTs for people who a chest ultrasound is either technically not possible or it's um, not consistent with the clinical findings. And that decreases radiation exposure and cost in children. So after you have your imaging, the next step is to get standard labs. So you're going to start with the CDC, ESR, CRP, COEGS, and a chemistry. Um, you want to get blood cultures if the patient's febrile. About 7 to 23% of these kids will end up with positive blood cultures and bacteremia. And often that's a good way of figuring out what bugs is causing your infection. Um, so the next step is getting a pleural fluid analysis. This is the LIGHTS criteria that we all learned in medical school. So you're looking for a white count above 10,000 with a neutrophil predominance, a glucose of less than 40, high protein and LDH levels and low uh, pH levels. And then finally, you want to check the microbiology of your pleural fluid. Interestingly, only about 30 to 35 percent of these will actually grow the positive agent, which is why sometimes blood cultures are helpful, um, but they're also bacteremic with the same bug. The most common types of bugs for pain is are strep and staph, and then there are multiple less common uh, infectious etiologies. So historically, there was a fair amount of controversy about whether or not you should be using surgery as a first-line uh, treatment for empyema, because there were some retrospective studies that showed a clear benefit to early operation, and then also questioned the efficacy of conservative management. That being said, over the last several years, there have been several randomized controlled landmark studies since the introduction of lytic therapy that have showed that really a stepwise approach to the treatment of empyema is the right way to go. And as a result, the American Association of Thoracic Surgery the British Thoracic Society, the European Thoracic Society, and the American Pediatric Surgical Association all agree that we should be using a stepwise approach. Um, this is the algorithm presented by APSA, or the American Pediatric Surgical Society for, uh, or Association for Treatment of Empyema. So the first step, step in this stepwise approach is to get drainage and source control. So there's really no um, role for a thoracentesis because it doesn't allow you to do continuous drainage or give intrathoracic medications. So as a result, these kids get chest tubes. Um, there have been several studies that looked at the difference between pigtail and large bore chest tubes, and really there's no difference in the ability to drain the fluid or the ability to administer meds. So in general, we tend to use pigtails because they're just a little bit more comfortable for the kids. Um, some people have discussed whether surgery or IR should be placing these tubes. And I think it depends on your kid. If you have a kid that's really sick, that has a large, very symptomatic effusion, often surgery can kind of quickly place a large bore chest tube at the bedside. And because it's a large enough effusion, you're going to hit it um, or take them up to the OR quickly and place the chest tube. If the kid is relatively stable and just having low grade fevers, um, and you have imaging that shows like a loculated, um, isolated effusion or a small effusion, then quite honestly, there's a real benefit to having um, ultrasound guided imaging um, done by IR so that it can truly adequately place the chest tube right in that effusion so you can get the uh, most bang for your buck as far as your um, intrathoracic medications. And then finally, the next step is just antibiotics. Um, so antibiotics are going to be guided by your patient's age, their culture data, whether they're vaccinated or not, and like the normal um, antibiotic resistance in your community. 
almost all of the treatment uh, protocols for antibiotics for all of these lung infections um, require kind of an extended course of antibiotics. So my personal opinion is that we should be getting ID involved or at least that can help us guide that management. So the next step is intrapleural medication administration. There's two different types of meds we give into the chest tube. The first one is the fibrinolytic. So there's three types, urokinase, streptokinase, and TPA. There's no data showing that there's any one medication that has been superior to the other ones, um, and they've all been used in clinical trials. The mechanism of the action for the fibrinolytics is that they degrade the fibrin and increase drainage by breaking up the loculations in the infusion. And then the second medication we use is DNAs or Dornase. Um, this is used in combination, combination with lytics, and the mechanism of action for this drug is it's a microlytic agent. So there was an article, it was small, it was published in a little journal you might have heard of called the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's pretty much the landmark study when it comes to empyemas. It was done in adults. It's a double-blinded randomized controlled trial of 210 patients. Um, they put you into groups, whether you got a double placebo dose, you got a dose of TPA and Dornase, you got TPA with a placebo or Dornase with a placebo. And when they found their outcomes, they found that adults that got TPA and DNAs or Dornase had improved fluid drainage, reduced frequency of uh, surgical intervention, and decreased length of stay. Interestingly, they didn't see a treatment response with the DNAs alone or the TPA alone. So then we said, well, what about in kids? There were three randomized controlled trials done in 2006, 2009, and 2014, respectively, that looked at using a, some type of a, of a fibrinolytic agent with um, a chest tube compared to a primary VATS. So the idea of getting a lytic versus just going right into the operating room. And they all showed the same outcomes, which is that you don't decrease the length of stay, the number of days on oxygen, um, how febrile the patient is by going straight to the operating room. Um, there's a significantly lower cost with using a chest tube um, and a lytic agent. And interestingly to me, the failure rate of um, using a chest tube and lytic is only about 10 to 15%. So the vast majority of these kids never end up having to go to the OR. Um, the 2009 study by Sean St. Peter and Dr. Osley also kind of pointed out the importance of the complications of these two interventions. So in their group that went straight to the OR for VATS, they had two kids that ended up on the ventilator and one kid that ended up with requiring temporary dialysis. But when they looked at the patients that got the fibrinolysis, none of those patients had a worsened clinical outcome after initiation of therapy, um, which is why they feel like definitely fibrinolysis should be your first line treatment. Then we looked at DNAs in kids. Um, there was a study done in Canada. It was a randomized control trial, included 97 kids, and they compared using a chest tube with TPA and Dornase, like we do in adults, just compared to TPA and saline. Interestingly, they did not find the same thing in kids that we found in adults. So there was no difference in length of stay, time from chest tube removal, fever duration, drainage procedures, or total cost when you use the second agent. As a result, this isn't part of the standard algorithm for treatment of empyemas in children. So the take home message is for how do you do this? So if you have a standard kid, a small child, you wanna use four milligrams of TPA and 40 milliliters of saline. You're gonna administer this through the chest tube every 24 hours for three days. And you wanna give them a one hour dwell time. It's really important to remember that this is not a weight-based drug. So you're gonna give the same dose of four milligrams and 40 milliliters of saline, regardless to whether you're giving it to a small baby or like a toddler or a school-aged child. Um, also, this TPA is not systemically absorbed, so you don't have to worry if the chest tube drainage is a little bit serosanguinous or bloody, or if they're a little bit coagulopathic. Obviously, you don't want to give this to someone who's in fulminant DIC, but it's not going to be absorbed systemically through their body. And then if you have a big child or an adult-sized person, my personal recommendations is to follow the MIST2 trial. It was a really well-done trial in adults, and it shows that there's a significant um, benefit in people who are physi physiologically the size of adults. Um, and the dosing for that is 10 milligrams of TPA and 5 milligrams of DNA or Dornase. You give it twice a day instead of once a day. It's still in 40 milliliters of saline, and it's still for three days with a one-hour dwell time. And we do have DNA that's available at our institution to give um, through the chest tubes. So for those of you who have never done TPA, it's actually very simple. So you just load on your syringe, you turn the stop clock off to the patient, and then you inject Sometimes um, they can complain of feeling kind of cold because these medications are refrigerated, but you can give it relatively quickly. It doesn't hurt them. And then this person's getting DNAs also. And so then you just put it on and then administer the drug. You want to make sure that you flush this after you're done giving the drug just because you don't want to leave any of the drug in the tubing. And then you keep it off to the patient for an hour. 
Um, you can keep it off either by having the staff cart toward the pleural back or toward the patient, it doesn't matter. And usually what I'll have the patient do is turn every about 15 minutes because the goal is to get the medication all the way around the chest cavity um, so they get um, the most amount of benefits to the medication. So after you're done with your three days of fibrinolytics, how do you decide who gets surgery? So I think about this if you ask yourself two questions. Number one, can I clinically make this patient better through operating on them? So you're gonna look, do they have an oxygen requirement? What's their fever curve? Um, do they have exercise intolerance? Are they still tachycardic? If at the end of the day, the patient's on room air with no fevers for the last 72 hours and their heart rate's 70, I probably am not gonna make them better with surgery, whether or not they have pleural fluid on their ultrasound. If they are, um, that they do have um, an opportunity to get clinically better, then you have to look about whether or not there's still pleural disease. Um, so you can either get a CT or an ultrasound. I'd recommend an ultrasound based on the data out. And if you see residual undrained empyema or fluid in the chest, they have pleural disease and they'll, they'll potentially benefit from surgery. If the CT just shows lung consolidations, nematoceles or lung abscesses, but there's no significant fluid, they have parenchymal disease and they're not gonna be helped by surgery. Um, so if you do end up going for surgery for an empyema, your primary goal is to drain the pleural cavity and to facilitate lung re-expansion. Um, so we do that, this through what we call VATS, which is just an acronym for video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. Um, there's also an open approach. VATS is considered the gold standard for this. Um, the conversion rate to open thoracotomy is about 1%. And the reason we don't convert is that open thoracotomies have a significantly higher morbidity, more post-operative complications, and longer length of stays. So if you're gonna do a VATS, um, your first goal is to suck out all the purulent fluid. Um, you wanna break up the loculations in the chest and then debride all of the fibrin, um, the fibrous capsule on the parietal and visceral pleura. The goal is to debride this inflammatory rind without injuring the underlying tissues. Um, so you don't cause any injury to the lung or significant bleeding. As you can see that that's a very inflamed and friable. You irrigate out the chest and then you leave a chest tube. Um, this is an example of an open um, bats, uh, or I'm sorry, an open uh, washout and deportation that um, I saw in residency. So the reason we don't rush the operating room for kids with empyema is that the complication rate is actually relatively high. It's about 8 to 22%, and the complications aren't small. Um, so you can create a bronchopleural fistula, you can create a pneumothorax or an amatoceal. Um, these kids can go into bronchospasm. They often get sicker before they get better. They end up in the ICU on mechanical ventilation. They can have a acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure, bleeding, and sepsis. And their post-op readmission rate for this operation is about 7%. So now that we know a little bit about empyemas, we're going to talk about the underlying disease process that calls, causes them, which is necrotizing pneumonias. So bacterial infections are prominent in the pediatric population. It accounts for about 3 million outpatient visits and um, 1,500 hospitalizations. Um, necrotizing pneumonia, or pneumonias will progress to necrotizing complicated pneumonias in about 3 to 8% of all children with a diagnosis of pneumonia. And what characterizes a necrotizing pneumonia is that there's extensive destruction and liquefaction of the lung tissue despite adequate administration of antibiotics. So the pathophysiology is pretty simple. The inflammation leads to vascular thrombosis that leads to tissue necrosis. The necrosis causes consolidations and those progress to cavitations. And then the cavitations either coalesce into form cysts, which result in pulmonary abscesses, or they rupture to form bronchopleural fistulas. So this is just an example of kind of what you see with imaging of a uh, necrotizing pneumonia. And whether you're looking at an X-ray or CT, you see the same thing. So you see this opacification of the lung tissue, and then in the center usually, or on the periphery, you see these areas of necrosis um, that are hypercolic or light. Um, so the first step in um, the treatment of necrotizing pneumonia, pneumonia is medical management. Um, so again, you're going to use antibiotics based on cold flu results, comorbidities, and antibiotic resistance. Um, I encourage you to consult ID early because they're going to need at least two to three weeks of IV antibiotics, and then often you switch to orals once they've been afebrile for 48 hours. They don't have any respiratory distress or oxygen requirement. Um, they have control of their sepsis and their tolerating fees. Um, it's important to push early nutrition on these kids because they're tremendously catabolic. Um, so you want early high calorie nutrition, whether that's oral or through a feeding tube. These kids will lose about 5% of their body weight during their hospitalization, and about one fourth of them won't regain that weight for the first month after discharge. So from a surgical standpoint, I like to think of when would I put the kid on ECMO for necrotizing pneumonias? And so there's a couple of positive prognostic indicators. So these kids will probably do well if they have a necrotizing pneumonia and they have to go into ECMO. 
Um, females do look better than males statistically. You want to look for kids that don't have significant pre-existing lung disease or medical comorbidities. Um, kids that have an absence of multi-system organ failure. So those kids who just need ECMO for ventilation and oxygenation and not for severe sepsis. Otherwise, children who would require VV ECMO, not VA ECMO, tend to do better. And then kids who have an underlying viral pneumonia have been found in some studies to do better than those who have bacterial pneumonia in terms of length of stay and mortality on ECMO. The indications for ECMO for necrotizing pneumonia are hypoxic respiratory failure despite maximum medical management. So you can use your OI greater than 40 as your cutoff. Um, you're looking for refractory respiratory acidosis. So if they have CO2 retention despite um, maximum medical management and significant high, high plateau pressures. And then if you have a really severe air leak, and because of the underlying um, pneumonia, you're having to use high pressure, sometimes we'll put them on ECMO to just rest the lungs so that air leak can seal. Because often those high pressures on the vent will make that air leak worse, um, and then we'll be able to seal. Um, so there are several contraindications. So a relative contraindication are children who've been on the mechanical ventilation, particularly at high set settings for greater than seven days. Those who've had a prolonged cardiac arrest from hypoxia and have an um, unrecoverable anoxic injury. And then those who have significant hemorrhage, whether that's pulmonary hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage. So the reason that we use the days on a ventilator as a relative contraindication is based on this study that was done in 2017. Um, the caveat to this physician was done in adult patients. They looked at 129 patients receiving VV ECMO for ARDS. And they found when they looked at the ventilator time before the initiation of ECMO, the ventilator time was independently a predictor of hospital death. And this is the curve that they used. When they ended up doing the math on this, they found that there was a pretty clear cutoff. So people who were on a ventilator for less than seven days had a mortality of about 38% on ECMO. And those that had um, had been on a ventilator for greater than seven days had a 77% um, chance of dying. And so this is why seven days is kind of used as the caveat for when we would think of a relative contraindication. The thought process behind this is after seven days of the barotrauma of the ventilator, you have significant lung immunity. Um, children who have necrotizing pneumonias often have long, prolonged ECMO courses um, as they're healing their lungs. And so this is an important study done in the Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Journal in 2012 that just looked at 3,000 children um, who were put on uh, ECMO for respiratory failure and found what you would expect, which is the longer they're on the ECMO, the worse they do. So at 45 days, the mortality, um, only about 25, 28% of these kids um, survive. And predictors of mortality are more than 14 days on ECMO, high initial PIPs when they're placed on ECMO, complication on ECMO, whether that's bleeding or um, circuit issues, um, use of pressors during their ECMO run um, or systemic sepsis, prolonged acidosis during their ECMO run, and then male gender. So the next question is, when do we operate on necrotizing pneumonia? And my advice to you would be wait as long as humanly possible. And the reason is that this tissue is incredibly friable. It doesn't take staple as well. It doesn't dissect out easily. So you can get a lot of bleeding and tissue damage. We try to wait at least six to eight weeks after the initial pneumonia in order to think of any surgical intervention. Um, and we try to reserve surgical intervention for those people who have uncontrolled pulmonary sepsis. Um, the reason for this is the mortality rate after these operations is pretty high, it's about 16%, um, which considering most of the operations we do is an awfully high mortality rate. Um, so this is the reason why. These are two pictures of kind of what you get out of a chest when you are operating on a necrotizing pneumonia. And there were two studies done um, in the literature for children. I'm um, looking at 35 and 25 children who underwent resections for necrotizing pneumonias. Um, they found mortality rates of 8.5% in one study and 0% in the other study. But it's important to know that these are maximally invasive surgeries. These are not um, thoracoscopic surgeries. They're getting open thoracotomies. At times, they're getting pneumonectomies, lobectomies, segmentectomies, um, decortications. And these big surgeries are wrought with significant complications, not just minor complications like bleeding and wound infections, but there's like a 16 to 25% major complication rate. From that, I'm talking about bronchial stump leaks, significant air leaks that require reoperation, um, postoperative empyemas that require serial drainage. Patients who chronically end up on a vent for six months to a year, and those who go into uh, kidney failure for, for develop hyper or hemolytic uremic syndrome. There are some children that we do operate on, and those are kids that we think ultimately have an underlying congenital lung malformation. So children with a congenital lung malformation are more likely to get infected in that congenital lung malformation. So you have to have kind of an increased suspicion that there's an underlying anatomical problem with the lung that's causing the infection. If you see recurrent infection, often in the same lobe of the lung, 
Um, if you have an opacification or a cavitation that persists even after the patient's well and the rest of their imaging is cleared, um, or if there was some prenatal concern for like a CPAM or a sequestration that was never adjusted. Um, ultimately, how we treat that is we're going to wait for them to clinically recover. We want them to be doing well and then wait usually a minimum of six to eight weeks after that. We usually re-image and we're looking for something like this that looks like an underlying CPAM and an isolated lobe. And the treatment for these um, congenital lung malformations is to do a lobectomy. The reason for that is it decreases your risk of it ultimately turning into a cancer and it also decreases your risk for incurring, um, infections. Often we can do these lobectomies with a minimally invasive approach if you wait long enough and let kind of the, um, the infection go away, but sometimes these do have to be converted to open if they had a bad necrotizing pneumonia at one point in time. So my question was, how do these patients do? We've all seen these CT scans of kids who have bad necrotizing pneumonias and they look terrible. Then you go see the kids and they look terrible. Um, but I've had the benefit of being here for two years and we get consulted on these kids all the time. So I looked back at some of the kids we saw about a year ago and there were two ones that I highlighted. So the first one was a previously healthy child. It was a boy. They had a necrotizing pneumonia that was complicated by a bronchopulmonary pleural fistula. We got consulted and tried and decided to treat them conservatively with just chest tube management. We did not operate. They had a total of a 27 day hospitalization and they got eight weeks of antibiotics. This was the first uh, CT on them. You can see this big, large necrotizing pneumonia that takes up most of the slope. Um, and the second child was a previously healthy five-year-old girl. Um, she developed strep pneumonia, um, and her uh, uh, pneumonia was complicated by empyema. Uh, we also treated her conservatively, decided not to operate on her. She had an 11-day hospitalization and got four weeks of antibiotics. And this is her admission CT. You can see she has this huge amount of fluid um, that was all this loculated pus when we drained it. She's got a little necrotizing infection up here and just kind of this collapsed consolidated lung. So when we looked at how they did, um, so this was the chest CT that was redone on this child three months post um, discharge from the hospital. And you can see the only really residual um, sign of his infection is this tiny little scar right here. Other than that, his lung is clear. And clinically, he looked great according to the notes. He was on room air. He had no significant comorbidity or morbidity from this and was doing well, keeping up with his peers. And this child, um, when she was discharged, this was her x-ray at discharge, and you can see that we got the fluid, um, but there was still some necrotizing pneumonia and op opacification there. And when you looked at her four months post-op, or post-DC, this was her x-ray. And so if you look at from across the room, it looks like a relatively normal x-ray. This child was also doing well at her pulmonology visits, no oxygen requirement, no significant problem keeping up with peers or symptoms. So our outcomes kind of go with all the long-term outcomes for necrotizing pneumonias. So at one month, about 35% of kids will have abnormal spirometry, and most of the chest x-rays will still look abnormal because you have to treat the patient, not the x-ray. The x-rays are going to lag on these kids. Um, at a year, only 2 to 6% of these kids have abnormal spirometry. Uh, most of the chest x-rays normalize around 6 months, and only about 4 to 8% of these kids will have abnormal quality of life scores, meaning that most of them kind of get back to their activities of daily living without much um, impact on their necrotizing pneumonia. So now that we know about necrotizing pneumonia, there's two complications that I'm going to highlight. So the first is a bronchopleural fistula. So in my personal opinion, bronchopleural fistulas are one of the most frustrating problems that a patient can have. Um, they have a really high morbidity and they often require long hospital stays and there's not a whole lot you can do for them. Um, so the incidence is about 7.8% in all the necrotizing pneumonias. And the hallmark is that you have an air leak in your chest tube where you have this inability to keep your lung expanded. Um, there's uh, multiple treatment algorithms, medical management, chest tubes for extended periods of time. In the adult population, people go home with chest tubes for these. There are types of surgeries. You can either try to resect them or do muscle flaps. Um, these surgeries have carried the same morbidity and mortality as operating on any necrotizing pneumonia in the acute period. Um, and the recurrence rate of these bronchopleural fistulas after we operate on them is still about 12%. And then there's some novel ideas that have been put out as far as using glue, foam, or coils endoscopically, but they haven't really panned out to show a superior agent. So the first step, like everything else, is conservative management. You want to treat them with long-term antibiotics, and then you want to use lung protective strategies. So if you can get them off the vent and off positive pressure, that's very helpful in sealing the air leak. Um, you want to use low tidal volumes if they are on a vent, so between four and six milliliters per kilogram. Low plateau pressures, you allow them to have permissive hypercapnia and use minimal PEEP. 
Um, kind of a novel approach is if you do have a contralateral lung that's nice and healthy and you're able to oxygenate and ventilate the kid with the contralateral lung, sometimes you can either put a double lumen tube or a bronchial blocker in. You can actually block, block off the lung that has the ear leak and give it time to heal so it's not seeing all that positive pressure. And then the next step is chest tube management. So sometimes the management of chest tubes for bronchial pleural facial is seen contraindicated. So what we try to do is turn down the suction. Um, so the point of the suction is to keep the lung expanded so it's not collapsing. But there's been randomized um, controlled trials that have been paired water seal versus suction for air leaks. Again, the caveat to these are these are mostly done for air leaks after surgery. Um, so state line air leaks, there's not a study that was done in kids with necrotizing pneumonia or adults for that matter. But when they looked at 140 post-op patients, 33 of them had an air leak, and they found that placing chest tubes to water seal um, sealed those air leaks um, faster than if they were to wall suction. And the reason kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you have a hole in your lung and you're actively sucking air out of that, and with the suction tubing, you're going to precipitate the bronchopleural fistula. But if you're able to decrease that suction and allow the lung to rest, as long as it doesn't collapse, um, then those tend to seal a little bit faster. So this was a patient that we saw like a couple of months ago in the CBICU who had a pretty bad bronchopleural fistula from a necrotizing pneumonia. And so we started with negative 20 of suction on her um, and kept her lung up. And so we turned it down to negative 10 and her lung stayed up. And we went to water seal and her lung fell down. So we went back up to negative 10 and we were able to re-expand it. And it was a process of multiple weeks of just trying to slowly creep down the, um, the suction. And you can decrease by intervals of about five. So another option for a prolonged ear leak or bronchopleural fistula is to try a blood patch. Again, the caveat to this is blood patches are pretty much only studied in the post-operative ear leak patient population, not the necrotizing pneumonia patient populations. But they do work in kids that have, or kids and adults that have um, air leaks after a staple line. Um, so there was a review of eight studies in 151 patients that looked at staple line leaks um, causing bronchopleural fistulas. And they found that they, um, the blood patches were effective in about 90% of those um, adults and that they had a complication rate of only 10%. It's a relatively easy thing to do with a low complication rate. Um, so if you have a bronchopleural fistula that you've been staring at for two weeks, I don't think it's a bad idea to try. Um, so this is how you do it. It's pretty straightforward. So basically you clamp the chest tube, you place a large bore IV that's fresh and new, and you take between one and 2.5 milliliters per kilogram of fresh whole blood from the patient, and then you infuse it back through the chest tube. Um, then you make sure to flush your chest tube with um, saline in order to clear the blood or you'll clot off your chest tube. Um, and then you clamp that chest tube for three hours, um, and then you place them to water seal and see if you're able to seal the bronchopleural fistula. Um, so you have to monitor them very carefully when you um, clamp them. If they have any type of desaturation or, or decompensation, you want to immediately place them back to suction. But if they tolerate it well, you want to try to reposition them every 30 minutes. Kind of the same philosophy you use for the lytics, just to kind of move the blood around the chest cavity and give it the maximum chance of sealing the fistula. Um, and then you want to get a chest x-ray after you're done with your clamp. And you open back up the um, section. I'm sorry, the chest tube. Um, the other novel thing that we're doing now is bronco or endobronchial valve. So we did our first one here a couple of months ago with Dr. Egan, and I scrubbed on that case. So if you have an air leak, um, you put the bronchoscope down. We used a rigid, but you also can use flexible. You deploy um, a sizing balloon. This occludes the bronchus, and it also tells you what size of valve you're going to need in order to occlude the bronchus. Once you inflate that balloon, you're able to look at this chamber for the air leak and you see the air leak go away. If the air leak persists, then you go to the next bronchus and you size that one and occlude it. And when you find the one that stops the air leak, then you deploy a um, endobronchial valve into that airway. The endobronchial valve has this balloon, our umbrella design, so it doesn't allow air into the area of the damaged lung where there's the air leak, so that can heal, but it does allow the mucus from that um, long in order to drain out so you don't end up with a big mucus plug. After about six to eight weeks as the manufacturer guidelines, um, the air leak should be sealed and you can use our easy removal device um, to just put your bronchoscope back into the airway and take out the endobronchial valve. Um, so this is the endobronchial valve that we placed in our patient in the CVICU. And then this is just another image um, that you sometimes have to place multiple endobronchial valves in multiple different airways, because you just have to go from one bronchus to the next and look at your chamber to see what it does to your air leak. Um, the nice, I'm sorry, 
nice thing about this is they seem to work. Um, so there was a larger study done in adults published in 2018 um, that looked at endobronchial valves for the management of persistent ear leak. It's a multi-center trial that did about 70 adults, and they found complete resolution of their ear leaks in about 88% of people, 9% had partial reduction in their ear leaks, and 6% had no benefit. Um, so we decided to try that in children. There was a small study of only four children that had persisted air leaks. Of those, two of them were necrotizing pneumonias. One was an amatocil and was, one was a lobectomy. And 100% of those kids had resolution of their air leaks. Um, and none of them had um, any need for surgical intervention. The one that we've done here had improvement of the air leak, but not complete resolution of the air leak. Um, one of the tricky parts to doing this as kids is just size. Um, so we did it with a rigid scope. Um, you can do it with a flexible scope, but you just need to have a big enough airway in order A, to have a bronchial valve that fits, um, and then B, also to be able to get your scope down. And so the final thing we're going to discuss is pulmonary abscesses. So pulmonary abscesses are caused when pneumatosis, or from pneumonitis causing necrosis and then cavitation and abscess formation. Your organism is largely dependent on what type of abscess you have. So primary pulmonary abscesses are the kids with other underlying, underlying normal lung. It's usually caused by whatever the infection is, um, which is usually staph or strep. And then secondary lung abscesses are kids who have some type of a lung abnormality, um, whether that's BPD or CPMs, or kids who have some type of developmental delay or a risk factor for multiple aspirations. Um, those kids tend to have graminated rods, sometimes anaerobes, and then immunosuppressed kids tend to grow fungal uh, abscesses. So abscesses on imaging look pretty similar, whether you look at a radiograph or CT scan, they're a well-demarcated thick-walled cavity that has an air fluid level. And the most important thing to remember is 90% of these kids will get better if you just use antibiotics. Um, again, it's a long course of antibiotics, usually about four to eight weeks, um, with two to three weeks of those being IV. Um, so it's important to get your ID colleagues involved. But there are some people who do try draining these abscesses. Um, there was a study done in 2012 that looked at um, 26 published studies um, looking at either image-guided aspiration or pigtail drainage of lung abscesses um, in order to determine whether intervention is needed um, for people. Um, their success rate, which they defined as drainage and improvement of symptoms, was about 83%, so a significant success rate. But the problem is the complication rate. When you stick a needle in these things, 16% of the kids have complications. And of those, 8% 8, 8 of them have bronchopleural fistulas. And anybody who's managed a bronchopleural fistula in a chest tube for multiple weeks knows that that's not worth it. Um, so my advice would be, unless you have a patient that is refractory to all medical management, you should try really hard not to instrument these. So we talked about a lot during the course of this uh, talk. And so I just wanted to go over the key points that I'd like you to try to remember. So from a chest tube management standpoint, I think it's important to do a daily assessment of your patient in your chest tube. You're looking for air leak. You're looking for your settings to see what you can change for the day, um, checking your titling to make sure it's uh, patent, checking your output and any issues with your system. Um, so in terms of necrotizing pneumonias, I think it's, early, it's important to remember that early surgery prior to six to eight weeks results in significant morbidity and mortality and should really be reserved only for patients with pulmonary, pulmonary sepsis. Um, patients with empyema, remember the doses are different. If, you use a if you're dosing for a small child, it's four milligrams and 40 milliliters regardless of their size for three days, once daily. And if you're doing an adult-sized child, I'd recommend 10 milligrams of TPA, five milligrams of Dornase. It's done twice a day um, for three days. And remember, the failure rate of this lytic therapy is only is less than 16%, um, which is pretty outstanding. Bronchopleural fistulas, the only advice I have is they're often very frustrating and require patients of long-term chest tube management. Um, but I do think endobronchial valves are a new avenue that can be quite encouraging. And then finally, lung abscesses. The take-home message is 90% of these will respond to antibiotics, so please do not instrument them or drain them unless it's absolutely necessary. So with that, um, I'm coming to the end of my pediatric surgery fellowship, so I just wanted to take a minute to thank some people. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Amanda and Dr. Osley. You guys have been with me since I've been a PGY1, 10 years or a decade of my life. Um, you've always watched out for me. You've always taking care of me and encouraged me, even like at points when I like had no faith in myself, you still had faith in me. Um, you guys came here and the reason I'm here is because of you. Um, so thank you for that. I can't imagine a better pediatric surgery fellowship in the country. I wake up pretty much every day, unbelievably grateful for the opportunity to train here. Um, and a huge part of that um, is because you guys brought me here. So thank you for being there through this whole process. 
Thank you to all of my staff. I have incredible staff. These are like 13 of like some of the savviest, most technically gifted, like incredibly generous people I've ever met. Um, they're just fun to be around and they teach me every single day. They tolerate all of my shenanigans, which I appreciate. Um, and special shout out to Dr. Natrika. He's my program director and he has just been there kind of to support me and back me up all the way through fellowship. Um, no matter what I do or how I go about doing it or how stubborn I am, you're always there for me. So I appreciate it. And thank you to all of my APPs. This includes my trauma APPs and my pectus APP and all of my gen surge APPs. You guys are like the backbone of all of our services. You keep the services running, um, keep me sane and happy and smiling. Um, so I just hope you appreciate um, how much I value what you guys do um, and how important that is. Um, Cause I know sometimes you guys don't get all the recognition you deserve. So I appreciate everything that you guys do. And then all the critical care intensivists and people in the CVICU, NICU and PICU, one of the most surprising and nice things about this fellowship has been how much time that the critical care um, people have invested in me. Because of them, I've learned about neonated feeding protocols and how to manage pulmonary hypertension and how to do event management in kids. They've just fundamentally made me a better doctor when it comes to taking care of small child children, which is not something you get in general surgery. Um, so thank you guys for investing in me. I really appreciate the time you've taken. Thank you to my junior fellow. Um, he keeps me happy. <laughs> he divides the work. Um, it keeps me laughing, um, whether we're just like talking in the office or um, dividing kind of the plans for the week. Um, I really enjoyed spending the last year with you. I hope we're friends for a very long time. So thank you for keeping me sane. And then last but not least, I want to thank Dr. Molitor. He's been my primary mentor and kind of role model through this experience. Um, I don't know how many countless infinity hours of mentor meetings and guidance he's given me over the last year and a half. Um, he's kind of invited me into my his family, so I feel less homesick. Um, he like guides me through all of the difficult decisions I've made. Um, and he just has this incredible um, ability to adjust the way that he teaches in order to help me learn. And as a result of that, I think that I progress more than I could ever imagine, both clinically and operatively, um, with him as my mentor. Um, I really appreciate you. Um, I can't imagine doing this without you. I know that Darth Vader is your favorite Star Wars character, but you are never going to be the villain in my story. So I think Yoda's probably more oh, applicable. Yeah. So that's why he's up there. Um, and with that, I'm open for any questions. Uh, first one, have you used... You have to repeat them. Okay. Have you used blood patches in any of our patients at PCH and what were the outcomes? Um, so I use blood patches probably half a dozen times at PCH when they're for stable line um, leaks. I've seen them work um, for like a necrotizing pneumonia. I've seen them work in one patient and fail in two patients. Very good. And the second one should be a pretty quick answer too. One of the most common questions we get from patients with necrotizing pneumonias is how long should they expect to have a chest tube in place? I know this is a moving target, but is there an average or approximate time we could tell the patients? So I think it depends on what your complication is. So if your complication is an empyema, my hope is to get your chest tube out within a week. If it's a bronchial pleural fistula, cross your fingers and pray, because those can be in there for weeks and weeks at a time. Um, and it's somewhere in between. You kind of have to see how they respond and what your therapy, what you're using the chest tube for. So are you using it to like drain a pneumothorax or a bronchial pleural fistula, or are you just using it to drain fluid? And then the other thing is how sick they are. The long, that's more sick they are, the longer their chest tube's gonna be in. So unfortunately the answer is a case by case basis. Well, great, great to talk, great summer. Um, can you comment on the three days? Because I think we don't want to have people say three days and then you have to offer it. I mean, there's some evidence about repeating yep. type of therapy. So again, I mean, this is kind of the standard of care, but you have to kind of look at your patient. Um, so I think that um, you start with three days, then you kind of look at your patient. If they're clinically improving, but maybe haven't completely normalized, um, and you have a fluid collection that you think you potentially can get three more days out, I tend to think about doing another round of TPA, um, particularly if my tube is not in the right position. So we recently had a patient where we had a chest tube in place. We did three days of TPA, um, cleared that empyema, we re-imaged, and there was kind of a posterior segment of fluid that wasn't drained. And so that's a perfect patient that you could have IR stick a like 
ultrasound guided chest tube and that new fluid collection and then repeat the TPA. Um, so I don't think we should go into any of these operations kind of with like any type of kind of um, idea that they're gonna be the kind of silver bullet because at the end of the day, they're relatively high risk of operations um, and really all we're doing is clearing out pus. There, there's not a lot of nuance to it. And so if you can get that with a chest tube, I would encourage you trying. Yeah. No, Chica. <laughs> This is a great thought. Uh, the uh, your your slide on uh, how long is too long to be on the billing before echo is a really interesting slide. But we've talked a lot about um, you know having a cutoff where we don't get people on echo and did that on the talk for a certain on the billing for a certain time. But looking at that slide, which is uh, I've never actually pulled it out before, it looks like you still get a lot of survivors after that time. You do. So is that really the correct interpretation of the slide that you showed us? So I mean, you have to read the paper and have to print it out because it's in my like group of papers for this talk. Um, but the when they ac actually did the math on it, there seemed to be a relatively clear cutout at seven days where the people who were on for less than seven days did substantially better than greater than seven days. And that's kind of how they came up with that. Um, but they do admit in the paper and you see in the graphs that I mean, ECMO works. Um, even you just It's a more high risk to ECMO run the longer you go, um, because the longer you're on a ventilator, the more barotrauma you have from those high ventilator settings, um, and the less likely you're able to recover that lung, because ultimately <laughs> it's barotrauma on top of a bad necrotizing lung infection. So, um, you know, when we're looking at the sensitivity specificity of a test, we are really into the inflection point. So when you're talking about living or dying, I don't know that an inflection point is really a good enough problem. Again, it's a relative contraindication. It's not an absolute contraindication. So you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. But these kids also have really, a lot of them have really long ECMO runs. And so you're kind of adding kind of the complications that go with that ECMO run in addition to kind of their pre-ECMO mortal mortality. Two more quick questions from the chat. Standard flush volume after TPA? Um, so four milligrams of TPA and 40 millis of saline and then flush it with a uh, 10 milliliter of saline to clear the line. And risk of using TPA if not needed? Uh, nothing. I mean, I'm sure there is one. I'm sure there is one, but it's small. I mean, so I, I think of TPA in a chest like I think of like oral vanco. Oral vanco is not systemically absorbed. If you give oral vanco to someone, they don't have C. diff. They're going to poop it out. If you give TPA to someone who doesn't have an empyema, it's going to come out as soon as you open up the chest tube. Sometimes they can complain of a cold feeling or it can be like a stinging feeling. So I guess that's there you go. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. In the British study, the pain so we tend to use TPA in the US because urokinase is not available and streptokinase is a little bit high allergen. Um, so people, more people have reactions to streptokinase than TPA. Um, okay, and we have a comment here from Dr. Balani that said to remind everybody to get an MRSA nasal swab if you're going to start MRSA coverage.